Now, you may have actually seen a picture like this in general chemistry. I vaguely remember many, many years ago when I took Gen Chem, seeing this, for example, for oxygen, O2, or something like that. At the time that I saw it, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I really understood it very well. It only took a, a lot of study, some OCHEM and some other things, to really kind of get a better idea what it's talking about. But it turns out to be a, a very useful way to represent what's going on with energies and shapes when we form a bond. Okay, so we're going to look at really a very simple bond, again, our hydrogen to hydrogen bond, in which we're only going to use our psi 1s from one hydrogen and our psi 1s from the other hydrogen. Now, this energy diagram works in a very special way that again can be kind of confusing at first. So, first thing to notice is that we have an energy axis, a potential energy axis. Now, the interesting thing about potential energy axes is that actually we generally don't take them down to zero potential energy. Instead, what they really represent is sort of the relative potential energy. And what we're mostly interested in is the difference, the distance that we are apart on this axis. So we're interested in the delta of the potential energy. Second thing to notice is that we have these lines out here. These lines basically represent energies. They're lining up with energy values on the potential energy axis. So if I move this line up, it lines up here. Whatever I, I describe with that line has a higher potential energy. In this case, I'm describing the potential energy of electrons that we would put in that orbital. Remember that an orbital relates the potential energy of electrons to their location in space. So hydrogen atom has one electron, it has a 1s orbital, that one electron will have a particular potential energy, it would be represented by whatever that number is. Now, the other thing we do is we draw lines to indicate our starting energy levels, which basically also indicates then our starting orbitals. So, this line represents the energy of the psi 1s of a hydrogen, and this is the shape of that psi 1s. This line also represents a psi 1s of a hydrogen, and that's its shape. And the interesting thing is we draw the starting orbitals on the outside. We then imagine those orbitals moving together, overlapping, adding and subtracting, the way that I just showed you. So when I add this 1s orbital to that 1s orbital, I get a new function. It's psi of sigma. I can plug in x, y, z's and plot the shape of the cloud. It would look like this. And I can also use an operator to determine the energy of that new orbital. And I'm not going to do that for you guys, but just understand that you can take this. There's a, another mathematical thing you can do, and it gives the energy. Okay, so when we do that, we see that the energy of this new sigma orbital is lower than the original starting energies of the 1s orbitals. In other words, we've had a change of energy, it's gone down. Okay, we also have to do the um, out of phase overlap here in the middle. We make a new orbital that I showed you how it looks, we call it sigma star. And its energy goes up, and importantly, the size of the energy change for the bonding orbital, the sigma orbital, that orbital goes down less amount of energy than the antibonding goes up. The antibonding always goes a larger distance away from the start than the bonding does. So we get a shape that is uneven, it's imbalanced. Now, why do they draw it like this? Well, I think that for those quantum scientists, they felt that this represented, in a way, the distance between these two atoms, right? So these are when they're far apart. When we move them together in the middle, this is the resulting orbital. 
So we put the starting orbitals on the outside and then we put the ending orbitals. Last thing they do is they join them, they connect them with these little dotted lines showing that this orbital contributed to that uh, molecular orbital and to this molecular orbital, this atomic orbital contributed to that molecular orbital and that molecular orbital and so forth. So our initial atomic orbitals are placed on the outside and we can see that the energy changes. Okay, so in general chemistry, we also learned about electron configurations. And we did diagrams that probably looked like this. There's lots of different ways to do them. I think when I first learned it in high school, we used circles to represent the orbitals. Then we graduated to squares and way more sophisticated. And what we do do in um, sort of advanced chemistry is we throw away the squares, we just use lines. The lines represent the energy. Now, these square boxes were supposed to align with a potential energy graph. It's just that very often you didn't draw that line, right? You didn't draw this axis, but in theory they could. Then what you would do is you would set up your empty boxes, you would count up how many electrons total electrons, not just valence electrons, but total electrons the atom would have. So for example, oxygen atom has eight um, protons in its nucleus. So when you just have an oxygen atom by itself, it has eight electrons. You then fill those electrons in using these little hooked arrows, one pointing up, one pointing down. You fill them in one at a time. You if you have to pair them up, you put them in opposite directions and you fill up a lower energy orbital before you start putting electrons in the, in the orbital above it. And finally, when we have degenerate orbitals that have uh, orbitals at the same energy, you spread the electrons out. So you go one, two, three, and then you put the fourth one in. So we can draw the equivalent diagram just using a line to represent the orbitals. So this box becomes this line, we put one, two, Typically what we do when we're making these diagrams is we sort of draw the arrows cutting right through the line. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This picture is basically the same, representing the same concept as this picture, just using different symbols. And we fill it the same way no matter how many lines we have and no matter how many electrons we have. If we had only four electrons, we'd go one, two, three, four, we'd be done. Okay? So now... What we want to do is we want to fill the new molecular orbitals the same way that we would fill atomic orbitals doing electron configuration. So going back to our diagram, this is the diagram that we made in the earlier section of the notes where we took the 1s orbital, which had a particular potential energy, a second 1s orbital, particular potential energy, they were on the outside. We brought them together in the middle, we created a sigma orbital which had a lower potential energy, we created a sigma star orbital which had an even higher different potential energy. Okay. Now, I'm going to use made up numbers, it's important to note, Okay. but this is just for purposes of illustration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign potential energy numbers to these um, lines. So we're going to say, for example, the 1s orbitals have a potential energy of 4. It's a made-up number, and I'm not even going to give units. Just 4. The uh, sigma orbital has a potential energy of 2, and the sigma star has a potential energy of 7. And the key here is that the difference between 4 and 2 is a change of 2, whereas the difference between 4 and 7 is a change of 3. The... the um, Sigma star changes by a larger amount than the sigma. Okay, so now let's say that we were actually making a hydrogen atom. Well, to make a hydrogen atom, we would take a, hyd uh, sorry, a hydrogen molecule. To make a hydrogen molecule, we would take a hydrogen atom with one electron. We would take a second hydrogen atom with one electron. Those one electrons would be in the 1s orbitals, and they would have this potential energy at the start, right? This electron would have a potential energy of 4. This electron would have a potential energy of 4. So our starting potential energy would be 4 
plus 4. It would be 8. Now, after we put them together, these disappear. Instead, we have these orbitals in the middle, but the electrons are still there. So we take, we have two electrons, we take them, we put 1, 2 into this sigma orbital, and we're done. We don't put any into the sigma star because we fill from bottom to top and we stop when we run out of electrons. If we look then, this electron has changed. It used to have a potential energy of 4, but now it's right here and it has a potential energy of only 2. And similarly, this electron also has changed to have a potential energy of only 2. So at the end, our potential energy is 2 plus 2, which is only 4. So our total change in energy is minus 4. Think of that as a delta G. When a delta G has a negative value, that means the process is favored. So this is a desirable result. These electrons get to lower their potential energy. They become more stable. Remember that the lower the potential energy, the more happy whatever the thing is, right, in theory. And so that's very desirable. So this explains why bonding is favored. Bonding occurs because when the electrons are allowed to come together and make new orbitals, and those orbitals have lower energies, the electrons have a lower potential energy, and that is favored. Furthermore, if the atoms were forced to separate, they would have to split back up into two separate higher potential energy atomic orbitals. The electrons would have to move back into those orbitals and their potential energy would increase. That would be undesirable. So there's an incentive for those two atoms to stay together, to move together always. That's a bond. Now, what happens if we were attempting, if we were to try to form a bond with helium, to make helium 2? Recall that helium is right next to hydrogen in the periodic table, and helium has two 1s electrons. Okay, so the first thing we would do is we would make our diagram, calculating our potential energies, drawing our lines. Okay, then what we would do is we would count up how many electrons. Now, since each helium brings two electrons, we would have two for the first helium, two for the second, we would have a total of four electrons. Now, the starting potential energy would be four for the first electron, plus four for the second electron, plus four for the third electron, plus four for the fourth of electron. So it would be four plus four plus four plus four. It would start at 16. We would then take those four electrons, we would fill them in, one, two, okay, but we still have two, so we have to go up to the next higher orbital, three, four and we would get an electron configuration that would look like this, sigma 2, sigma star 2. We would then calculate the potential energy. Potential energy would be 2 for this electron, 2 for that electron, 7 for this electron, 7 for that electron. So it would be 2 plus 2 plus 7 plus 7. Turns out that adds up to 18. So what we see is, by taking these atoms, forcing them together, making new orbitals, making the cloud flow into these orbitals, the electrons actually increase in potential energy. They become less stable. They become more unhappy. So therefore, those atoms would prefer to just separate so that their electrons could go down into a more happy configuration. And therefore, helium doesn't want to form a bond. It prefers to stay as two separate helium atoms, and that is, in fact, what we observe in nature. So, scientists felt that the molecular orbital theory gave a very specific, clear-cut explanation of why atoms form bonds, why some bonds are stronger than others because the potential energies are different, why some atoms don't form bonds, they felt it really answered a lot of questions about chemistry.